would remind you why uh, did we uh, just uh, came here today. Uh, we are about to have a lecture and a discussion on uh, religious housing, heritage and property, and political insight into conflict over urban space. Uh, is engaged anthropology the future of the discipline? Um, and let me just uh, introduce you one more time our today's guest. Um, uh, Professor Michael Hersfeld from uh, Harvard University and uh, Dr. Kasper Kubotki from uh, Adam Mickiewicz University in uh, Poznan. Uh, they are just about to start uh, two short lectures about their experiences uh, in fieldwork uh, over urban space and after that we're going to turn to the um, discussion. So Professor, I guess you're going to start the lecture, right? Thank you very much. I think I'll try and do without the microphone. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. yes. I think it's probably clearer without the uh, interference from the microphone. So thank you all very much, and thank you for inviting me, and thank you also for pairing me with a distinguished colleague who has, I think, very much the same attitudes uh, about many things. So we should have an amiable discussion, uh, which I hope will be illuminating. Uh, I want to start simply by making a distinction between applied and, um, and engaged anthropology. That's a bit like applied anthropology. Now, wait, for some reason we've not a little, we've lost the, ah, there we go, no? There we go. Okay, that's, that's what I think applied anthropology looks like. Um, it's taking some bank or um, government's policy and ramming it down the throats of the people and saying, this is good for you. That's not what anthropologists should be doing. Now, some applied anthropology is, of course, quite benign in intention, but a great deal of it uh, comes, I believe, out of a mistaken feeling that one can simply take the findings of anthropologists and uh, uh, apply them in some quite mechanistic way. Uh, I think that's a mistake. Uh, I prefer the term engaged anthropology, and by engaged anthropology, what I mean is you start with a completely academic involvement. You are trying to acquire a certain kind of expertise. Uh, you wouldn't, after all, trust a doctor who couldn't write uh, a, a, uh, a medical, uh, uh, what do you call it? I can't remember it in English. Uh, in English. Now, I'm completely confused. Um, uh, oh, called prescription. Uh, prescription, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I don't worry, I haven't learned any college, but this one I'm just keeping your attention here. Anyway, um, you can't say, so yes, you can't, uh, um, uh, you can't uh, trust a doctor who doesn't do that, and you couldn't, shouldn't trust an anthropologist who says, I'm here to help you. Anthropology has got some prescriptions for uh, dealing with problems on the ground. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. But I simply wanted also to begin by saying that I also don't like the term informal settlements, because that implies that governments have the right to decide what is formal. In fact, most of what I call informal settlements develop very strict internal self-governments, because that's the only way they can survive. And I'll give you some information about one such case in Thailand later on in what I have to say. But what you do see is that informal settlements are seen as here as the enemy of government, except, of course, that government doesn't send its own representatives. It sends hired thugs, usually belonging to some kind of underworld group. And that's actually a scene from the clearance of the Nirali Highway in Karachi, Pakistan. And one of the interesting things about that is that most of the people they were trying to clear out were Hindus of Indian origin, so I think you start to see here already the dynamic that very often eviction is actually a form of, if not ethnocide or ethnic cleansing, then at least a form of spatial cleansing, getting rid of people who don't fit the dominant uh, uh, middle class uh, capitalist view of the way society should work. And that's what's happening all over the world. So here in the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, the last remains of a settlement that was uh, actually built for bureaucrats of the city government 
have been swept away to make way for these high rise buildings. You see one in the background. What an irony that the whole city is being wished Happy New Year, and not only in Vietnamese, but also in English to make sure we understand that globalization rules. Well, globalization doesn't have to rule, and that's what I'm here to talk about. So what are the, uh, the key issues? So people often say anthropology is so theoretical, it has nothing to offer the practicalities of life. No, but I wouldn't trust an anthropologist who didn't know his or her theory first. So that's why I'm saying I think that a real engaged anthropology has to grow out of a fairly strict training in anthropological theory and, and method um, because that actually gives us a kind of legitimacy then to go and argue with the misuses of anthropological theory that are often put forward by governments. Uh, one very interesting example um, uh, in, from Eastern Europe, uh, the late dictator of Croatia, Mr. Tuchman, uh, used to use Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations as a kind of justification for his attitude to genocide. and. Huntington didn't quote a single anthropologist from 50 year, within 50 years of the publication of his own book. But he cited a lot of older anthropologists, uh, and I must say that I think that was a, a totally, uh, uh, well, let's say evil misuse of, of, of ideas. Now, not all engaged anthropology works, and not all of the ideas that anthropologists might be thought to approve of work. Take the case of the Grameen Bank, uh, where what actually happened, the idea was great, women will be empowered by having access to micro credit. What actually happened was that some women, those who were a little bit wealthier in the village pecking order, did so much better than those who were right at the bottom that the eventual effect was to increase the class differentiation within these Bangladeshi and Pakistani villages. So it doesn't work the way it's supposed to be, and had there been anthropologists on the ground, they probably could have told the Grameen Bank exactly why that wasn't working and what they needed to do. Um, I don't actually think there is such a thing as pure theory, but again, you have to study it to realize that. Um, there's such a thing as an objectivist illusion. When I talk to Thai audiences, for example, about my work in, in Bangkok, and they often say, especially the social sciences, how can you be objective if you uh, are so involved in the community you're studying? Very simple answer to the question, two parts to the answer. Part one, the objective subjective distinction is a very parochial piece of Western philosophy, lasted about 300 years, it's already dead, and any good physicist can tell you that. Right? Second part of the question, so you think I shouldn't be involved, but if I hadn't been involved, the people in the community wouldn't have trusted me with all that information. So clearly, an objectivity for you means less information. That usually ends the conversation, and it should. <laughs> However, I also want to say that non-anthropologists listening to me talking as you are today, but I know there are many people here with an anthropological background, are sometimes a bit shocked when I start to introduce examples from places like Thailand and, and Pakistan to talk about European issues. There is a residual racism, I would argue, in all of us, and we have to be very careful to watch out for signs of it. Often, the kinds of problems that are being faced by uh, disadvantaged populations in European cities are so similar to those that are being faced in Africa and Asia and Latin America that the comparison is extremely useful because it helps us to identify the global scale of what we are dealing with. Uh, I attended a few years ago a conference organized by the Wenner Grand Foundation on Engaged Anthropology, and it produced a set of essays which you can uh, consult in the journal of Current Anthropology. It's a special issue of that journal. Uh, and the paper that I wrote was actually a more detailed version of what I'm going to be presenting to you today. The term engaged anthropology is certainly gaining ground in North America and in Europe, but it's still being treated as simply an alternative way of saying applied anthropology. And I do want to make the distinction very clear. I think that as anthropologists who also see our own discipline, if I may put it this way, threatened with eviction from the universities, we are actually facing a related problem, and therefore we have to fight it in the same terms. Beijing. 
hutong. But this is not a real hutong. This is something that was built after the real hutong were destroyed by the authorities. It is equipped with all sorts of modern conveniences. It's a replacement for the original, and of course, not a replacement in which the original inhabitants are able to afford to live. What happens is that the old alley houses, or hutong, are replaced by these copies, uh, some of which, as in this advertisement I took off the web, are uh, advertised to foreigners as a great place to uh, experience the real life of traditional Beijing. Well, hot, cold running water, uh, air conditioning, uh, service to the room, uh, a nice cool patio in the mornings, just like traditional Beijing. And meanwhile, the people who used to live here are being treated as migrant laborers uh, and <coughs> being pushed out to the furthest outskirts of the city. This is an example of what used to be called urban renewal. And developers will still say to you, of course it's urban renewal, we're improving the neighborhood. That is, we're getting the riffraff out. That's what they mean. They mean they're moving people out. And Neil Smith pointed out, as you all know, that the a much more appropriate term for this, because it points out the class nature of it, is gentrification. I also like to use the term spatial cleansing, which is obviously more of ethnic cleansing. And I define spatial cleansing as a process in which the functions of the city are stagnated. <coughs> So you have markets in one place, religious places of worship in another, uh, commerce in another, and so on and so forth. This is the modernist phantasmagoria that in its most extreme uh, manifestation you'll find in places like Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, where the hotels are in one sector, the banks are in one sector, even the travel agencies have their own sector, and you have to drive a car to get to any of these places. The people who come into the city to work are bust out to very distant suburbs. Uh, they can't live there at all. Now, it is true that there are sometimes situations in which the larger uh, good of the general public is served by evicting a small number of people. And when the case is made democratically and with the vast to object, but that presupposes that those people will be properly compensated, and that very rarely happens. Um, so we need to look at how these property regimes work. We need to look at how they invoke the idea of national or regional heritage, very often as an excuse for the destruction uh, of local uh, groups. And remember, in the words of the motto of the Center on Housing Rights and Evictions, housing rights are human rights. Or, as the Habitat Resolution of the United Nations puts it, every human being has the right to a habitation that affords that person to live with dignity. We can argue about what dignity is, but habitation doesn't seem to be a problematic concept. Fast forward to my research in Thailand. We don't have very much time, but just to give you a taste. This is a little fortress that um, is part of the old wall of the city, built in the period 1782 to 86. We are on the city side of the wall, but in the other side of the wall, between this very thick wall and the canal, is a community of 300 people, mostly defined as squatters. Legally, they are mostly, indeed, squatters, but they have created a sense of community uh, that the local authorities want to replace by creating an honor, in, in, uh, sorry, a park in honor of Her Majesty the Queen, which will be an empty lawn with nothing in it. And the houses are not in very good condition, but they are, in some cases, remarkable examples of vernacular Thai architecture of the um, late 17th, uh, sorry, late 18th uh, and 19th centuries. And I would add that um, the current conservation regime wants to get rid of most of that material because they really don't want to recognize anything except palaces and temples, which again tells you something about the class of nature. The community is organized to resist. They have endless meetings with a very talented leadership. They involve um, academics. I put this in to show how one can become engaged through the action of one's informants. I thought I was being very proactive by saying to them, you know, you could use the fact that I'm a professor from Harvard and you can, because it has a lot of symbolic value in Thailand, uh, maybe that will help to persuade the authorities at least to talk. It turned out that's why it was there in the first place. They plotted to get me there. And I <laughs> fell right into the trap very happily, I might say. But it was an object lesson in respecting the intelligence of your informants. And it's something that's absolutely 
quintessential to doing this kind of work because none of this work can be done with the condescending attitude, I'm here to help you because you need help. I'm here to help you because you invite me to and when you tell me to go away, I will go away. Actually, so far they haven't told me to go away, but um, they also understand that if at some point there's an emergency and I get a phone call from them, I'll hop on the first plane and get back up to Bangkok. This was a, an impromptu um, uh, uh, press conference I was forced to give in Thai um, because the gentleman on the right in the is wearing a suit and tie as a local visiting politician finally decided I knew more about the community than he did and that I should answer the journalist's questions. So of course I was able to give it a good spin for the community and probably tell you more truth than any politician would do. Similarly, I was uh, able to see the community president show this politician one of the several plans they've made for the redistribution of space as a way of getting the houses organized um, in a livable pattern on this restricted space that would be combined with a park that they were prepared to construct around their houses, always in honor of Her Majesty. These are dancers from uh, an occasion they were using to raise money for the restoration of the Citadel, so they were very much wanting to be responsible for the conservation of the architectural heritage. They also had academic meetings. This was a conference at Chulalongkorn University, sometimes actually called the Harvard of Thailand. Um, and the speakers are a mixture of, from left to right, uh, a member of the community who is uh, just a member of the internally elected managing committee, an archaeologist from Tomasite University who is an activist, and a member of the royal family who is a sympathetic architect who has lent his support. And I want to use this to contrast it with the experience I had the other day when I visited a, uh, a housing group here in, in, in Warsaw, where all I heard was constant grumbling about how academics will never help us, lawyers will never help us, there's no point in even talking to them. And even when I said, so what am I doing here? It seemed to be like water off a duck's back, they weren't interested. They, they tried to tell me, yes, well, here in Poland, things are different. You cannot succeed in fighting power by invoking cultural stereotypes as a reason for backing off. And that's what most people were doing. The Thais don't do that. Even if you have an image of the Thais as being fatalistic Orientals, forget it. These guys fight. And they fight in very constructive ways. This is an architect, former government bureaucrat. They managed to enlist who, as a way of making merit, uh, is, is helping them design the future by moving <coughs> scale models of the houses they would like to live in around on a map so that they can figure out how to make enough room for the trees and grass that will constitute the park. To Rome, where I've also done field work, very close to the Colosseum, in an area of considerable <coughs> historical depth, two and a half thousand years here of architectural fabric. And in this area, uh, you see the, the greatest defender, in fact, is the church, because the church owns a lot of property, even now, and uh, is constantly evicting people uh, in order to raise money, of course they can invoke Italian law and say it's for the benefit of the church, which is considered to be a charity. What that means is they raise a very expensive hotel, uh, mon sorry, they make a very expensive residence, which they either use as a residence for senior priests who are thought to need a certain degree of comfort, or, or turn into a hotel to raise money for the church. And it's interesting that whereas the activists have managed to get up to the roof and have this sign that says Santa Casa without the home, homeless. In front, the church is allowing a huge billboard, so Mammon certainly is in cahoots with the church on this one. Now, in Rome, uh, you have, of course, a master plan as you do in Bangkok. Uh, I'll skip, these are slides from another talk, I'm going to skip some of the details, but I do want to say that in Italy, um, you can actually justify almost any change that has been made by reference to a system called the Condono in Elite. So if you build illegally, as long as the building isn't actually dangerous, you can usually wait for one of these things to come along. And this is designed very much on the model of the Roman Catholic uh, uh, system of indulgences and the confessional. Um, in fact, most of the, the bureaucracy was created on the Vatican model. 
Um, the uh, government will announce what is called a collective pardon, and you go to the appropriate office and you declare the fines that you already owe, and they calculate what 10% of those fines would be. You pay the 10%, and in exchange, you get the piece of paper that says you are now absolved of the need to pay, to pay the rent. And they use the word absolved. So believe me, the model is very clear. In fact, I said to one of the officials, I don't really understand what this is all about, playing dumb anthropologist. He said, but Professor, don't you understand what a Catholic <laughs> country? I think they call him, I can make that doesn't need any explanation. Uh, interestingly enough, it was a left-wing government that began the so-called liberalization of the rental situation in Rome, which led to a rash of evictions. There are now at least 16,000 more homeless people every year in Rome as a result of this. Um, so the word liberalism was acquired uh, a rather different class from what it used to have. And the so-called rent liberalization is truly neoliberal in the sense that it is operated by a Thatcherite ideology that says, the weak can go to the wall they deserve to. Do we want a world like that? I would hope not. This uh, is the central square of the area where it was working. The locals became very intolerant of Eastern European and other migrants living in this area, including Ukrainians, for example. I think that when the left-wing government in particular, so-called left-wing government, acts actually more like a capitalist institution and pushes people out of their homes, it's not surprising, I'm not trying to justify anyone, but it is not surprising that it then increases resentment against immigrants who are occupying the same space. So the government talks with two sides of its mouth. On the one side, it says it wants to take measures to reduce the tension between local people and immigrants. And on the other side, it does everything it can to increase that tension by putting pressure on the housing market. Uh, that, that's just a, a fascist monument that was preserved because it preserves the names of the people who died, albeit from fascist government. This is the most left-wing place in Rome, incidentally, which is sort of interesting. And I simply put these two memorials to the dead from two very different societies in to remind you that one of the things that anchors people to their old places of living are the memories of the people who have passed on. And if a country should, can be saying to us we should honor uh, and respect the memory of those who died for the country, shouldn't people be able to do the same for those who lived in their communities? Christ in Rome is certainly a severe figure, so of course the image of whom we go to for mercy is the Italian mother. Um, and this is again interesting because this area has more of these medallions of the Madonna child. I thought it might mean that this was a much more pious area than any other. It turned out on the contrary. These are this is one of the low-life low areas, and they needed more intercession. Um, so this had a lot to do with their attitude towards the place itself. I'm going to pass over these and simply go to some, some slides that show you what's happening. So here is one of these apartment buildings that had many families living in it, now being sold uh, uh, as uh, apartments and shops. You can see that uh, what's happening is that a house that was allowed to fall into dis disrepair, I'm sorry, allowed to fall into disrepair and become quite run down, ends up being, um, how should I put it, uh, gentrified up from the inside and out. But what you see on the outside is not a big change. On the inside, uh, all these houses end up looking like this. And this house actually was the one from which my friends were evicted from rat infested stucco peeling off the walls, uh, horribly damaged and damp apartments that the Bank of Rome very cynically kept that way in the hope that the people would leave so that they could then uh, uh, sell the building and have it, as they say in Italian, ristrutturato, restructured. And it's restructuring, whether we're talking about economic restructuring or the restructuring of, uh, of real estate that is at the heart of the neoliberal plan to make every city a bastion of people of wealth and to remove from it anyone who could threaten that wealth. It is now conceived, and like the one I began with in China, it's being turned into a hotel. So, where do we end up? I want to draw this to a, a, a quick conclusion so that Casper can uh, have his turn um, and 
I'm offering these points perhaps as a basis for conversation with him and with all of you. First of all, we will get nowhere if we don't respect all parties. We have to talk to governments, we have to talk to others, we have to talk to proprietors. They do have rights. And the only way to teach them to respect the rights of others is to show them that we respect their rights. That's hard to do sometimes. But we also have to explain to them that rights and moral obligations may not always coincide. And that a decent world that will be secure for them as well as for the poor <coughs> is one that respects all of this. This is actually an issue of security just as much as terrorists. If you have an increasing number of people who are homeless and desperate, this is a breeding ground for all sorts of problems, social problems. So this is to open up debate. And learning from the computer community debates, I learned so much from listening to my Thai friends arguing three times a week about what they should do, whether they should open up the wall so that people could get in and out more easily, whether that made it riskier for them, what kind of discussions they should have with the police, the army, town. Well, they made alliances with the police that were very useful to them. <coughs> and the police, as a result, did not take very kindly when the army moved in and actually removed two rows of houses. So they have continuing protection from the police. We need to explore alternatives to neoliberal gentrification. There's got to be another way. And that means a public discussion that doesn't simply descend into violence on the streets or calls for the rich to be stripped of all their wealth. It does, it seems to me, I mean, in, in the United States of America, this is a very hard argument to make. It does call for much more punitive taxation than most countries are willing to contemplate. But one has to show people why and how taxation works in the way it does in order to show that when somebody is making literally millions of euros or dollars every year, that security becomes worthless if they have to lock themselves into a, a, a gated community from which they have virtually no escape. I don't feel particularly sorry for them, but I think they don't realize how much they're digging themselves into a kind of social isolation that is very much part of the spatial cleansing I associate with the ideology of neoliberalism. We also have to teach ourselves and others not to be tolerant. Tolerant isn't, tolerance isn't enough. I'm actually against tolerance. Tolerance is a form of condescension. We have to accept that people are different. We have to live side by side with people who cook food that smells very strange who maybe have toilet habits that we don't like, who have make noises that we can't stand. We have to learn to talk to them and come to some sort of compromise. We need, in other words, not to talk about tolerance, but to try to achieve higher degrees of acceptance and explain to people why we don't like certain things. It doesn't do, as the anthropologist Ernie Dickon uh, claims, uh, that we should say, for example, to Muslim migrants in Norway, well, you have to become better Norwegians because they're redefining what being Norwegian means anyway. It's no longer exclusively a white Christian identity. And the whole idea that they're a fixed identity is so profoundly anti-anthropological, I don't think I need to say anything more about that to this audience. And finally, we need to understand that some forms of conflict are productive. Now, there are societies that are conflict averse. They're usually conflict averse because they're afraid of its consequences. Americans hate arguments, for example, because they think that if you argue, the next thing is somebody will pull a gun, and they're probably right. I discovered recently, because I work with a university in Norway, Norwegians were telling me, we cannot get people to publish enough because they become so jealous of each other that we're afraid the conflict would break out. I've been told that there are some similar phenomena in Poland, and I see some <laughs> smiles of acknowledgement, so I'm entering the zone here of what I call cultural intimacy, um, and I hope you won't object to that. But as the Italian urbanist and scholar, Enzo Scandura, has written, conflict is essential to making urban life bearable. Conflict does not mean hatred. It does not mean warfare. It does not mean violence. It means a context of disagreement in which we can live with those whose habits we dislike, whose arguments we reject, but whose fundamental humanity <coughs> we perceive and we see as the thing we share. If we can't achieve that role then and that condition, then the whole goal of engaged anthropology seems to me to be missing. 
But it also seems to me that if we can't achieve it, all of humanity is lost. I'm very reluctant to say that anthropology of the discipline will save the human race from its own stupidity. But if I look at science, sociology, economics, if I'm saying, right? What's left? Philosophy. Left. And I think <laughs> there are many disciplines that can help. And I also know many wonderful economists, as a matter of fact, who contribute significantly. But as a discipline, we are so committed to grassroots involvement. We do field work. We talk to people. I know economists who say quite calmly, I'm not interested in people. I'm interested uh, in building models. Well, you know, you can't eat a model, you can't live a model. And the models have mostly gone wrong anyway. <coughs> look at the predictions economists have made, may have look at the mess we're in now. So I'm making a plea for us to be a little bit more militant, but not violent, militant and conflictual, if you like. <coughs> Kaspar and I could have argued so we can set you a good example. But this is what I call, and I want to leave you with this phrase, the militant middle ground. We don't have to be extremists about this. We have to argue for a space where everybody can have their say. That was the original idea when we talked about democracy, but the word democracy has been so watered down as to be almost meaningless. When people like George Bush invoke it, I despair of its having a future. That's why anthropology is a good alternative. Thank you very much. Uh, situation, situation in Poland, and Kasper will uh, provide us with some examples from Poznan, but not only from Poznan. Um, I think I'm going to disappoint you. I, I, I don't think I, there's too much disagreement between the two of us. Um, so what, I, <laughs> what I'm trying, so not, not much conflict, although I will talk about, this is, this is one of the interesting points you made, and it absolutely um, applies to my own experience as well, that actually conflict, conflict is a wonderful uh, learning, uh, a polygon for, kind of a, for learning, uh, learning ground, and we tend to live in this kind of, we tend to have this kind of a very lyrical idea of society and of democracy where all this sort of social conflicts are absolutely swept under the carpet straight away. And uh, one of the things I've, I've been doing for the last four or five years is precisely whenever I try to smell a conflict, I'm like, okay, this is a very interesting intellectual uh, situation because if you look at the city as a as a body i don't like this metaphor but i think in this in this con context it actually applies you know and then there are these conflict spots in each of the cities where you have special conflicts between different groups of residents between the uh, the, the, the the power of the, the municipality and the residents between business and developers and residents and so on and if you delve into these conflict spots or conflict areas this is Precisely where you can start learning how the city, uh, how the how the city uh, works. Um, so what I'll try to do is to build on the second point you, you made as well, namely the uh, the very reasons why engaged anthropology um, is the future of the discipline, but not for political, ethical reasons, but actually for intellectual reasons. So why actually uh, good anthropology is um, uh, engaged uh, anthropology? And why, um, okay, I mean, okay, this is not my point, so I'm going to um, uh, uh, evoke to, to, to Marshall Salis. He wrote this wonderful uh, a little article a couple of weeks ago um, that came to my mind when I was listening to your talk, explaining why he resigned from the US Academy of Sciences uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and one of the things, uh, one of the reasons he did that was that he was not uh, very happy about the uh, the way anthropology was applied, okay, so harking back to your distinction between applied and engaged anthropology, was um, applied in, 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 in US military uh, engagement. Now, one of the things he wrote was that actually he wasn't aware that of the fact that actually this was nothing new, okay, this has been going on for a, for a long time, but that was one of, his, well, one of the reasons for him to, to resign. Now, one of the very interesting points he makes, um, he compares physics, anthropology to physics, and then he has this whole passage where he explains, so he shows all the paradigm shifts in physics over the last century. And actually, if you look at it, then uh, anthropology as a body of, of knowledge is much more stable than uh, physics. And basically, you know, there are always 
every, every decade, essentially, there are these revolutionary changes in physics where you know, we realize that somebody comes up with this ever smaller particle uh, of, 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 of matter. Now, and what Salins does, he, he, uh, he turns back to this 18th century natural philosopher who basically says that um, we as human beings uh, can know um, only something that we have, uh, we have uh, um, uh, engendered, something we have created. And uh, the physical world of the outside world, the world that the, the real scientists are studying, is the work of God. So obviously a human mind will never be able to fathom um, that kind of uh, sphere of, exp of, of reality. So basically what he says is that in many ways anthropology, because it studies human societies, um, and precisely because of its engagement, is much more objective than, um, than physics. Now I wouldn't go that far, but I think uh, this is a very interesting point that, uh, that speaks to our debate, namely the, the, uh, the intellectual um, um, uh, merits of, of, uh, of being involved. Now, um, I decided something like six years ago to write my uh, PhD about cities. Okay? I haven't lived in Poland for a very long time. I, I lived abroad and then I came to Łódź. I tried to, to, um, to understand how uh, Poland works through the urban, um, urban, uh, uh, urban lenses. Now what I realized was that actually nobody really knew what was going on. In the sense that I've tried to survey the, uh, the academic literature and basically uh, there was nothing that was uh, that provided me with the key information of how actually to use the Lefebvre's uh, uh, vocabulary, space is produced. Now as I realized later on, this was not very surprising because at that point exactly, that was around 2004-2005, there was a radical shift in the way Polish space was being produced. If you look at the Polish urban history, then um, the real watershed, so the real uh, jun junction of accession to the EU is much more fundamental as, uh, as a breaking point. If you look at the way law functions, for instance, um, um, then 2004, this is really the beginning of, of today, in many ways. Okay? So this was not very surprising that, that at that point, I couldn't really find uh, um, satisfactory uh, intellectual um, product that could explain, help me to explain how cities work. And uh, when I um, when I came back from uh, uh, from the US, I had some friends in, in, in Poznan. I wasn't living there at the time, uh, and I heard about these these, these protests um, against a military base that was that was um, uh, that was uh, based in in uh, in Poznan. Um, and what struck me was precisely what uh, Neil Smith uh, called uh, a little bit earlier, this idea of jumping scales. And I think this, is, this, this was the process that I, uh, I noticed. And this was exactly the, something that, that allowed me to jump into the, uh, uh, the movement. Now, what jumping scales is. Um, if you look at the way um, both the media and also a lot of the academic literature writes about urban movements, um, and the word NIMBY, not in my backyard, is probably something that uh, rings a bell. Um, in most of the cases, these movements are uh, described as movements of local residents, okay, who basically defend their own interests, their own particular interests. And uh, if you look at the way the media writes about it, it's, it's always the, the local residents, or the, uh, the neighborhood residents, who are have some uh, claims. Okay? Now, well, the interesting thing about about what was going on at that time in Poznan was that exactly what I saw was very different in the sense that this military base has triggered a movement of jumping scales in the sense that residents would move from this very local neighborhood uh, bounded type of activism towards an activism that worked at the uh, at this urban scale as a whole, the, the scale of the, the city as a whole. And the, um, after a year or so, the, uh, the, a lot of the different uh, groups from different corners of the city, they founded this, 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 this city-wide alliance, uh, which was called My Poznaniacy, which basically mean, meant we, the residents of Poznan. Now the meaning, the, 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 I mean, the, 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 um, the name of the, of the movement is very uh, telling in the sense that <coughs> precisely it was a way of reclaiming the urban scale from the, uh, from the municipality, okay, because the uh, the, the, the municipality, the mayor would always say, okay, you guys in this part of the city, you defend your own particular interests, 
you guys defend your own particular interests, but I'm the mayor of all of the residents of the city, and I defend the, the, the universal interests of, of everybody. Okay? So what they did, they reclaimed the, uh, the urban uh, scale. And, uh, and, and at the same time, um, and now I was not the only kind of academic around, so I'm not going to kind of claim all the... Uh, um, um, I'm, I'm not going to claim all, uh, that this was only my kind of uh, um, doing, but uh, there was a lot of there was a number of other people who, who were from the outside. Okay, and now uh, as you as you uh, mentioned uh, before, for people who are local residents, uh, somebody who comes from the outside is basically a very it's a potentially a very powerful ally. You know? I'm not a, a famous anthropology professor from Harvard, so of course I was not a powerful ally. But um, well, basically, uh, but it, it was, it was, it was a, I was a PhD student at that time. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, so for them, having somebody from the outside, you can show them and explain and help them to to understand that the local struggles are not very particular, they are not very local, and they have to do with a larger um, logic of the, the way space is produced. This was something very um, attractive and, uh, and very productive. So for instance, one of, the, so one of the skills I could kind of let out was the, uh, was the skill of writing. Okay? Now for you guys, the, the skill of writing is something that you take absolutely for granted. But if you, um, so you can, comp um, not in the sense that writing, uh, that, you know, the alphabet, actually, but composing a, a text. Okay? Now, for most of you guys, this is something that, that you take for granted. I mean, you know how to do it, you write essays and so on and so forth. But a lot of people who have, for instance, technical education, um, and the people I've worked with were basically coming from that background. Like, for them it was something enormously scary. To write a, a newspaper, an article that could be published in a newspaper, there was something very difficult. I mean, they were absolutely amazing in, in terms of uh, their oral uh, skills. So they were very good in, 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 on meetings. Very good in talking back to the to the uh, to the mayor. Uh, very good in, in arguing. Very good in organizing, but writing not. So one of the things we managed to do is to start building a website. Okay, we started uh, kind of uh, uh, functioning as a, as an alternative sphere uh, for generating a public uh, debate. Okay. So again, this idea of jumping um, jumping scales. Now, so but for me, the uh, uh, the most productive aspect of this um, engagement of, of this cooperation was precisely that I could learn a lot about the way Polish space was being produced. And in the process, and the process of this took four years, this is a very long, um, um, this was a very long time span, um, we managed to generate, and by saying that we managed to generate, I actually don't know who came up with this idea first, um, and how it came about, but actually these are uh, concepts that are absolutely crucial, at least in, in Poland right now, but also in Poland at large, for um, for both explaining how things work and changing the way things uh, are being done. And there are three concepts that we um, managed to create through that engagement. Um, and the most obvious one is the idea of urban movements. Now, uh, actually, there's some, there's a colleague of mine from Wrocław who traced back when this concept was first used in Polish, it was something like 2010. And the idea of, of, of talking about urban movement as a distinct phenomenon was that in the very beginning, uh, uh, the kind of residence uh, mobilizations were either described as incipient uh, political parties, so like the beginning of a building up of, of a political movement in the sense of a, 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 a small beginning of a political party, um, or as an NGO, right, so the non-governmental sector. Now we had this idea that we are something else, that there's something else going on, there's something new going on, and it's a sort of a different piece. And at a certain point, somebody came up with this idea, and now it's basically all over the place. I mean, if you, if, if you, if you listen to the media, uh, I mean, the, uh, even the president of the, of, of, of the country talks about uh, urban movements as a phenomenon, okay? This was something that came out through that kind of intellectual engagement and through intellectual work with uh, with presidents. Now, another one is, is something that I'm still struggling. Um, I still don't know what's, what's, what will be the best English uh, translation. In Polish, it's narracja konkretna, which is something like a tangible narrative. 
it's basically the opposite of, of symbolic politics. And, uh, and this is something that, that was very important in, in showing that there's a different type of discourses that are being generated by these kind of activists and by these kind of uh, conflicts and by these kind of movements. Okay, because one of the most amazing things about um, the last six years of, of urban mobilization is this, this precise thing that it, it, it allowed for different groups of people to bridge existing gaps. Okay, so I mean, at the um, at the level of symbolic politics, for instance, a lot of the activists, even from 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 one group, would be either right or left. You know, some of them would vote for left parties, others would write for for, for for vote for right parties. Now, what they realize that actually they have um, from the level of national symbolic politics, there should be actually two antagonistic camps. Now, they realize that actually they have much more in common than the things that uh, um, um, divides them. Um, and the idea of this, this, of this tangible narrative, so not uh, kind of high uh, symbolic narratives uh, 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 and symbolic politics, you know, like right and left, Catholic, atheist, and, and so on and so forth, but the city as a tangible narrative, okay, um, became an enormously, enormously productive and enormously popular. And the, third, the, and the third one is the idea of a social expert. Now, when we started uh, back in 2004, there was this very clear cut di division between experts who had knowledge and residents who had claims or interests. Mm -hmm. right? Now, over the last four years, um, the, uh, and not only for me, but also for a lot of the residents uh, and the, a lot of the activists, being involved in many of these Polish participation conflicts was an, an, an enormous, enormous uh, learning process. So I learned about how the city works, but they learned a lot about the way law works, for instance. Because at a certain point, you cannot do these kind of things without, without like by, with being totally oblivious to the way law works. You have to learn a lot. You have to basically learn the language of the, uh, of the, of the power holders to be able to talk back. And they always talk, about, they always talk law. So in, in order to be able to talk back, you need to learn uh, law. So one of the things that, that uh, um, um, came up in the last four years was exactly this idea of, of a social expert. So somebody who's between that kind of a dichotomy, okay? Somebody who's a resident, but a resident, but actually who has an enormous knowledge, which often is actually much more detailed, and much more uh, accurate, um, and much better than the knowledge of, of the so-called experts and uh, city councilmen. Um, these guys are normally they don't even know what's going on. They just uh, they just vote. So these are the three um, ideas. Okay, so these are actually intellectual ideas that were created through the kind of uh, uh, everyday engagement in uh, spatial. Uh, <coughs> and this is just an example. And I, I mean, I could go on for another uh, half an hour, but I think my time is uh, is up. This is just an example of how intellectually productive that kind of engagement can be. Now, of course, there are also downsides to it, uh, but uh, we, might, we might talk about uh, talk about that too. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess that uh, both lectures just gave us plenty of uh, potential uh, subjects to discuss, but let me just um, uh, refer to what uh, both of you just said. Um, you've mentioned that actually right now we face kind of production of space and you refer to Henry Lefebvre uh, thought, yeah. right? And actually he was kind of, um, his thought was kind of similar to what uh, Neil Smith uh, once argued that actually gentrification became kind of a gener generalization, right? So, uh, right now, if we think about um, being engaged anthropologist, as you said, uh, it would be very, um, very uh, living and fruitful to uh, look at the way people just negotiate this or uh, gener um, uh, gentrification, which is uh, kind of uh, generalized right now. And also, we have this kind of situation where um, urban planning itself became uh, mm, uh, said to be urban renewal, right? Which is kind of uh, uh, 
positive notion itself. So we have plenty of times a problem to um, challenge this notion because as we hear it, it sounds very good. And also if we see in uh, the space or buildings in a city that are radicalized or um, uh, <coughs> under the construction, right? Uh, we cannot see what comes uh, after that. Yeah, we cannot see, as you said, the inside of, of the space. So actually, we do not realize that uh, urban renewal is actually uh, urban cleansing, right? Spatial cleansing. Um, so yeah, we want to. <laughs> Well, I have an immediate uh, response on two levels. And one point that I think uh, comes out very nicely from what Kaspar was saying, uh, and perhaps we should explore a little further, is the point about social experts. Because social experts are not only anthropologists or indeed academics. And while I argue passionately for recognition of the role of academics, and respect for their role. At the same time, we have to understand that people who live in the communities uh, understand their problems in analytic detail, and they're just as good at theorizing as we are. They just use their theorizing for a different purpose. Um, it used to be very difficult to say this even to anthropologists. They would become very annoyed at the idea that ordinary people could be theorists. I think we're now past that, that prejudice, and, and I think, therefore, uh, you know, it's it's really important to push that point because, in other words, there has to be a more egalitarian discussion that recognizes the virtues of both the academics and whatever we mean by ordinary people. If we don't get that reciprocal respect, we're not going to go anywhere with this whole discussion. The second point is really just a comparative, uh, almost an ethnographic point, which is that in Italy there is a huge split between the academic urbanisti, basically planners, and the ones who work in the offices of uh, municipality and, and government ministries. And I think that's probably true in many countries. I think it's a general problem. The question then is, how do we start getting anthropologists infiltrated, and I use that term uh, advisedly, into the thinking of the people who sit in those offices so that they actually start to listen to the academic planners as well. Uh, it's beginning to happen uh, in my university. We have a new collaboration with the Graduate School of Design. I'm actually now, I have an appointment uh, in that school as well as in my own anthropology department. And I think that, and we've had a lot of students who've been interested in these problems, including some former architects who decided that um, they were tired of being told that design was more important than inhabitants. So I think that we're moving slowly, incrementally, and with great difficulty in the right direction. And one question that I would love to hear this group's views on is how to strategize to make that process A, faster, but B, more understandable to the general public. Because a lot of people out there just think academics are useless, and frankly, a lot of the time they're right. Let's be clear about that. Um, a lot of people out there don't have the patience or they're suffering and they don't have the time. You know, things are happening to them, they're being evicted and they don't have the time to stop and think. Um, how do we therefore, I mean it seems to me you've created in this very room a, a public, right, a, almost in the Hubbellasian sense, a public, sits around and drinks coffee or wine anyway, um, <laughs> but uh, um, can talk about these things in a way that might draw others in. And the question is, how do you do it? So that's something I'd like to throw out to the general discussion. So, <laughs> any thoughts? And as usual, well, the well, toxic I silence. I could ask a question. Oh, yeah. I hate to ask the first question because I'm not an anthropologist. I'm a philosopher. I'm from the field of philosophy. Um, but um, I'm very interested in what you, you're working with um, here. And so uh, is Thailand maybe one of these, um, could you use your experiences there as um, one of these places where um, the, um, uh, the um, social expert and uh, the um, um, uh, official and uh, the um, aristocracy and the uh, 
it, are learning how to uh, have open discussion and reciprocal exchange. I wish we could. Unfortunately, I mean, it's an interesting idea. Unfortunately, uh, the bureaucracy of the Bangkok Metropolitan Administration, which is essentially town hall, uh, is very divided internally. And what's interesting is that the local people in the community have very effectively capitalized on those internal divisions. So um, I could do them a disservice by pointing this out in the newspaper. I want to do that. I'll do it in my academic publications because I want to understand and I want people to understand why there are these divisions within town hall as well. So in other words, I don't think that I think it's utopian, probably, to think that we could ever arrive at a point where everybody will clamber on board. But if we can get a, a dialogue going that is public enough, I mean, what that little community of 300 people in a city of 12, no, I think it's more like 20 million, has achieved is quite extraordinary because in a few short years, they've actually <coughs> successfully resisted eviction, collective eviction, after 21 years nearly. And they've done it in such a way that a public that was very hostile to them because the authorities were putting it out that they were all drug addicts, it now turned into real respect for the fact that they embody the kind of values that the rising middle class would like to embody, but recognize that in some ways it has failed to embody. So I think it's more a case of how do you, I hate the phrase, but how do you get the hearts and minds of people uh, behind <laughs> of, of the public, then I think the bureaucrats will start to listen. After all, they are, to some extent, subject to public pressure. Uh, but I don't know, I mean, that, that's how it's working in Thailand. I don't know if it would work like that here in Poland, for example. Or, I, it hasn't worked in Italy. In Italy, the problem is very different. First of all, the church has tremendous control over hearts and minds. So <laughs> criticizing the church for what it does, is fine in Rome, which is wildly anti-clerical, as the Romans love to tell you, we live next door to the Vatican, we know exactly what they're like. And even people who are deeply religious are very critical of the religious establishment. And of course, everybody, both sides, invoke the Christian doctrine that all Christians are by definition sinners. The bureaucrats as an excuse, and their victims as an accusation. But the problem is that the church has moral authority. It has a lot of priests and local representatives who are very good people. And again, I respect those individuals. I think it's important, again, not to make blanket accusations here. Right? Um, and it also finds itself somewhat unexpectedly operating in parallel with a number of other forces, banks, private owners, including uh, very large companies like the Pirelli Tire Foundation, for example, which is a big landholder, and the Mafia and other underworld organizations. So with that situation, you have a fragmented but very powerful block picking off different bits of real estate at a time. In Bangkok, you're dealing with one tiny community occupying a symbolically very important space and say to the entire country, if you destroy us, you are destroying Thailand. Which you can't do in Italy because the whole idea of a united Italy is an absurdity to most Italians. You know the saying, what was it when, when Italy was created? One of the members of the Risorgimento, um, Count D'Addegno, said, uh, now that we've made Italy, we have to make the Italians. And most Italians would say it still hasn't been achieved. It's a very fragmented country. Thailand is very different. So here is where anthropologists become important because they analyze culture, they analyze cultural dynamics. That's what we do. And the trouble is when we start talking like that, governments get very nervous and start kicking us out. That's happened to many, and I've been kicked out of Greece by the colonels. Lots of anthropologists have had that kind of experience. Um, so what do we do? It seems to me, again, that by creating a public discourse in which more knowledge about what anthropology is, is disseminated, is the first order of business. Until people stop saying anthropo what? <laughs> right? I tell my first year students when they're still trying to decide what field to major in in the American system, they do everything in the first year. So I say, anthropology is the study of gossip raised to an academic level. <laughs> Why not? 
And then when they say, how is that important, you know, the political scientists and the economists particularly, I say, what do you spend 80% of your waking moments doing? That's statistically important, isn't it? <laughs> All right, so we have to be very honest about what we do, very forthright, and project this image of a discipline that tries to understand everyday life, and therefore is competent to talk about the consequences for everyday life of the machinations of a very small number of extremely powerful actors. I'm getting carried away, but take off the question. <laughs> no, I mean, for, I, I think what's, what's very important is this strategic alliance between um, um, some of the most more kind of uh, open-minded strata of the technocrats that you were uh, talking about, and precisely people like anthropologists. So, for instance, I don't know how this came about, but for instance, a lot of the very interest, interesting urban festivals in Poznan are organized together by anthropology and architecture students. And actually, I was at the, uh, at the meeting um, organized by the mayor, and there was, there was this big uh, uh, owner of one of the bigger uh, uh, private schools in Poznan, and uh, it was actually a meeting with Jan Gell, so, uh, and the, the, exactly this, 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 the, the same topic came, came up. And then this guy said, oh yeah, uh, well, oh yeah, because Gell said that he was an architecture student, and his wife was a sociologist, and that's how he learned, uh, like he met this woman who was a sociologist, and that's how he discovered that there was something like, like a society, okay? Normally, uh, architecture students are not, are not told by their uh, teachers that there is something like a society, and actually there is a, there is a, and there is, there is a group, group of people called sociologists or anthropologists who have spent quite a long time kind of trying to understand how this works. So young girl realized that there was something like a society because he married a sociologist. Now, uh, so what this guy... Uh, what, we all have to marry uh, yeah, this, this, this guy who runs this big uh, where he brings anthropology or sociology students, young and, uh, and architecture students together, maybe something productive will come out of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, uh, that's a good yeah, thing. I think it was a business, uh, I think he had a business idea there. But, I mean, this, is already, this is already happening in, on, on many levels. And I think this, this strategic alliances are very uh, fruitful in the sense that they are... Uh, because normally when people say anthropology, um, most of people from the outside think this is basically like lousy science. Or they, okay? think, it's, uh, or they think it's archaeology yeah. or bioanthropology. So it's either yeah. skulls or basically like going, hanging around. And you know when to do anthropology in Greece, everyone says, oh gee, it must be wonderful to dig up the Acropolis. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'm interested in investigating a range of people, contemporary people, sheep thieves, are people living in slums, bureaucrats, academics, people like you and me. Then if the conversation continues, I know I've got somebody interested. <laughs> Mostly they walk away, of course. <laughs> but actually, you know, this is, this is tremendously important what you're saying, because um, and, th and there's another dimension to it that I think is a real problem here in Poland, because I've been hearing that people with academic employment in Poland do not have the time to do serious, long-term ethnographic research. I know that there are exceptions, but by and large, the structure of your universities does not permit the half-year or year-long field immersion once you've got your PhD. So it's okay when you're a student, once you're a professor, you're as it were prevented from doing what you most productively do, and which is the best gift you can then pass on to your students. I mean what makes my students excited when I talk about my field work, not when I, you know, talk about those arid abstract theories. So the other fight you have to pursue is in the universities. For the right to a sabbatical that takes you and also the right for extra time to learn languages so that you get more field exposure. Most, there's a strong anthropological tradition in this country. After all, you produced Balanovsky, even if my native country gave him a home. And, but we should forget that there has been a lot of, no, but there's been a lot of really important anthropology going on. Much of it written in Polish, I'm just beginning to find out about it, realizing, you know, trying to help people also find channels to transmit it to an English-speaking world, because that's also very important. But at the same time, Polish anthropologists need to have more opportunities to get out there and go to other countries where they learn foreign languages, deal with other cultures, come back and say, and here in Poland, my goodness, this looks exactly like something I saw in the slums of, of uh, Manila or Cairo or, or Durban or, or, or even you know, Port Moresby. And people will be shocked, but remember that a shocking comparison, like a shocking metaphor, is one that works. 
You've got to be prepared to shock people out of that complacent sense that they understand they know the world and there's nothing further to study. Knowledge is the best. Yes, I mean, I also have a comment, but maybe we can open yeah, that up. We'd like to encourage you. Yeah, here is a comment. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for those uh, really fascinating lectures. And I have a question which um, it's a little bit different, but I would like to ask you about your experience. So, uh, what about violence? What, what happens when you encounter violence in the field? For example, violent eviction or some other form of violence, or you encounter people who experience violence? And this, I think this makes all this idea of engaged anthropology way more complicated. I'm just getting the violent slide up. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, you, so what do you do when you see you want to. Yeah, Well, I mean, <laughs> there are different types of violence. I mean, being beaten up, beaten up is not something I would be very much concerned with. I mean, you get beaten up, <coughs> um, or you get into a rough situation. Okay, it's a demo. Um, that's okay. Now, uh, I think this is a very interesting question in the sense that there is also. Um, um, if, if you get involved in, in a movement, okay, and, and if you do it for like a longer time, and of course you, you get into these group dynamics, okay, so you basically stop doing participant observation, but rather you do something which you could call a kind of observant uh, participation, okay, um, and uh, um, and yes, so first one of my experiences is that. Uh, one of the learning processes that uh, went uh, went on uh, over the last four years was this uh, was this um, um, appropriation of, of a legal language. Okay, and this is something that is quite universal. We are showing a, a very nice documentary on uh, on a movement in South Africa called Dio Mandela. But essentially, this urban movement uh, uh, of slum dwellers in, in South Africa. Uh, started changing the constitution. Okay, so what they did, they they, they hired lawyers, they learned the uh, law, and so on and so forth. You know? um, yes. Now, uh, and th again, this is not a process that takes on uh, go goes on like that takes place over overnight. Okay, this is a very long, much longer uh, process that unfolds for for a uh, um, for a couple of years actually. Is that this kind of language? Uh, of, 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 of the law, the legal language, actually infiltrates the movement. Okay? Mm -hmm. And what I've, what I've been uh, dealing with over the past few months is precisely uh, a lot of internal conflicts that have um, been based on appropriation of the language of the oppressors, so to speak. Okay? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the... Uh, um, so the conflict between the, 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 the pristine residents, so to speak, and the uh, uh, and the municipality who uses the language of law has been transported in internally. Okay? And you know, if you if you get involved, then well there's no way out. You know, you really uh, um, it, it it takes it takes its toll. Um, and uh, actually I was quite struck because a, a couple of months ago I read this article on Huffington, Huffington composed by uh, by a gay activist from uh, from the US who was it's, um, who was um, describing exactly the same kind of internal group dynamic within within the movement, okay? and I was like, okay, well, that's quite uh, quite universal. Um, so I think there are the, these are the two aspects of of, uh, of violence, and it's you know it's it's the price I guess you pay for. Uh, I mean, so there are the good sides and there are the downsides. I didn't talk about the good, the downsides uh, initially, but thanks for the question. I think it's important to bear this in mind. Well, I have a slightly different answer on this one, and it's two pronged. On the one side, um, purely anecdotal example from my own field experience, and on the other side, a very general point that perhaps encapsulates something of what you just said. Um, the specific point was my experience in the community in Bangkok. Now, I am a total coward when it comes to violence. I'm a gentle, peace-loving person who likes a good meal and a glass of wine. And, you know, I don't like to be to get into a fight, and I'm not very good at dealing with it when I when I do. I've experienced violence. I've been knocked down in the street by a mother, but you know, I don't like it, and I don't <laughs> see it, and I don't think that it helps the situation. Uh, even as a means of last resort, usually. There may be cases where it does, but in the whole, I'm, I would counsel against it under any circumstance. However, the authorities use violence. 
That's what you see up here. Even if they don't go in themselves, they're responsible for that violence. In Pomahaka, the community that I studied in Bangkok, one day I was told by the, my wife and I were there, and we were told by uh, some of the residents, look, we think that they're going to send these kinds of goons in tomorrow to burn down the wooden houses and smoke us out. And so if you want to see how we defend ourselves, and they do, pointed sticks on the inside of the wall so anyone coming over would be impaled, uh, huge uh, barricades, um, and they were ready with nets to go over the back of the, of the canal at the back so that they couldn't come up behind them with a boat. So I thought this was a fantastic opportunity, in fact it turned out to be, to see what preparations they were making. And then somebody said, but you know, it might be rather dangerous, perhaps you shouldn't come. Well, I sometimes joke and say, you say that to an anthropologist, and of course the obvious response is, yes, I'm coming. <laughs> but in fact, there is a reason behind that. Because I suddenly realized in that moment of truth that I had reached a level of moral commitment to these people that made it impossible to say no. So I committed the greater cowardice of refusing to face my own cowardice. I couldn't deal with it. I knew that I couldn't look at myself the next day in the mirror if I didn't go. And my wife obviously felt the same way. We turned up at quarter to four. At four in the morning, they down came the barricades. In the end, nothing happened. And I think that our presence was probably the reason. Like, there was one family that was disaffected. And my hunch is that they phoned the authorities and said, there were these pesky foreigners here with a video camera. You better not try anything today. And of course, once that happened, everybody knew what nearly happened. And so, uh, well, that was my gutsy and cockfight moment. After that, everybody was you know, totally <laughs> trusting, et cetera, et cetera. But my point is that, that you can't predict these moments. Human life is indeterminate. Everything is uncertain. And so the point about being an anthropologist is face your obligations. At that moment, I had no moral exit, at least none that I could square with my own conscience. I had to be there. These people had given me a great deal already. I know that I was also, in a sense, trapped by their interests, but there was a mutual engagement. They were my friends, and to me, the most valuable, the most important value in human life is friendship. I say that in all sincerity, and I think that, that in moments like that, you really understand what friendship is. You are prepared to face violence for those you care about. Otherwise, what is the value of that friendship? Now, that strangely fits with a much more abstract level, and this is my second point, mm -hmm. that violence is not always physical. My Harvard colleague, Paul Farmer, I think, kind of coined the term structural violence. The violence of poverty, the violence of bureaucratic oppression, mm -hmm. the violence of totally unequal access to resources, the violence of vocal racism, which, by the way, as a Jewish child growing up in London and in England, I experienced in its worst form when my undergraduate advisor said to me, you know, you need more self-discipline as well, and Auschwitz would have done you good. There are many forms of violence, and they're all painful. But humans do commit acts of violence, and they're not always physical. So I would say that the moral commitment has to encompass the whole range of violence, and you have to decide how you're going to deal with violence. I have no trouble now facing my own feelings of guilt that I wasn't strong enough in opposing the Greek junta when I was a student, and perhaps could have been more involved in the anti junta movement. I plead that I certainly took a hand in some other things. When it comes to people I know personally, and anthropologists know their subjects personally because they do feel work, that's the whole point again. When I know those people, and my personal feelings of friendship fit so perfectly with my hatred of any form of violence, then the only kind of violence I'm willing to commit is something that I am morally certain will overturn that violence. So I think that there is a philosophical framework that one needs to develop for dealing with this. This is simply the brute end of something much more pervasive. What the neoliberal ideology is doing to ordinary women and men throughout the world today is a horrendous form of violence, and it's no less horrendous for being invisible. In fact, it's hypocritical as well as violent. So to me, the question that you've raised, Danieszka, is not an easy one, but it's an easy one to answer, not an easy one to deal with. I have nightmares about it sometimes. What do I do if somebody comes to me and points a gun at my head 
and says, you're leaving the community or you're dead. I, I can casuistically reason and say, well, if I get killed, then I'm not there to fight for them another day. And, and maybe I would. And maybe I would. Because we all have to make choices. But let us at least recognize the environment in which we make those choices. And I think, again, anthropologists are peculiarly well located to do that because they know the people they work with. These are not my informants. These are not my subjects. These are my friends. I don't like all of them equally, but I care about all of them equally. 